Hello, everyone. People are just coming into the, the Zoom, so I, I know that they're going to be tumbling in over the next two minutes. I am very thrilled to see you. Uh, the default is to have the video off, but feel free if you want to have your video on at any point during the Zoom. It's always lovely to see people's faces and their reactions, uh, and there'll be times when you'll want to turn it off, and that's fine, too. Welcome, everyone, to this workshop. We are going to be pursuing passions. Uh, and uh, I'm glad that you're here. This is a workshop that will help you envision climate success, and more importantly, what next? What are our next steps? Once we're successful, then what happens? I give this particular climate workshop in business schools around the country. I find that business majors and students studying entrepreneurship really like this workshop. They, they both walk away with a clearer picture of climate change, but also with fresh business ideas. It's really designed to open up your thinking and to expand your imagination. How it's going to work is there's actually going to be a lot of time for quiet reflection, time where I'll give you a prompt and you'll just get to think about it and write about it. We'll also have times for breakout groups. There'll be three breakout groups. Now, if you find that music helps you to concentrate, feel free to play for yourself some music during the reflection time. But of course, keep yourself muted. Thank you. Uh, and for this workshop, one thing you will definitely need is a piece of paper or a notepad and something with which to write. And although you could type in your notes and your reflections, there's actually something about the physical aspect of handwriting that helps unlock creativity. So creative folks in marketing and all, they, they often have these planning sessions where they begin with paper and pencil. So if you don't have that near your desk, feel free to run out and get, get some. I'll give you a moment to do that because that's an important, that's going to be definitely an important part. And there'll be a number of times I'll refer you to your paper. You know what, it's also nice because it'll get you off of the Zoom for a moment where you can focus on something else. And at those moments, if you want to turn off your camera and be in your little space writing, that's great. Now, this workshop is definitely different from, from most. Uh, and how it's going to work is I'm going to walk you through some activities and show you some films. And I recently did this workshop for the entire CCL staff at our retreat, and it went really well. Uh, and one thing I learned is that whenever I ask you something, it's really important that I will give you an example of how to do it so you see it modeled. In, in this workshop, there'll be times you're going to work on your own, and you're going to work in small groups. And you'll be in the same group of people three different times. And it would be a significant amount of time. I think there's a squirrel in my attic. It's a little terrifying. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> um, that wasn't part of the production here. Uh, now, throughout this entire workshop, the chat's going to remain open. So feel free to write comments and reactions in the chat. But if the chat is something that distracts you, feel free to ignore it. But as, whenever I give a prompt, uh, you're going to see the prompt in the chat. Now, before we go any further, though, I want you to meet the team because it is not just me making this magic happen. Uh, Tamara Statton is CCL's Education Engagement and Resilience Coordinator. What an amazing title. And the Greater Pacific Northwest Regional Coordinator. Uh, and she's also operating as our Zoom tech. Hey, Tamara, how are you? I'm great. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Mindy Aller is providing our chat support. So she's going to put all the prompts in the chat. She is CCL's Northwind Regional Coordinator. And Mindy, for people who don't know, where is Northwind in the country? Northwind, we are Minnesota, Iowa, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Nebraska. That very windy yeah. north central portion of the US. Appropriately named. Todd Elvins is CCL Action Coordinator, which means he like is involved with lots of actions. Uh, most recently getting people to call their members of Congress. He's a friendly presence in our Zoom today. If you have a question, feel free to ask Todd. If he can't answer it, he'll ask one of us and we'll get you the answer. Also, if someone should misbehave in the Zoom in any way, Todd will gently toss you out into the internet darkness. Todd, have you ever had to toss anybody out before? Oh, I've never tossed anybody, but I'm ready if I need to. <laughs> okay, great. Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to start this workshop in a rather strange way. I want to start by acknowledging where we are right now, and in a way, who you are and how amazing you are. And to do this, I'm going to show you a short film I made. It's about the pandemic and the suffering that 
we've all experienced. Now, clearly some of us have suffered more than others, but all of us have been facing challenges. And more importantly, I think we have overcome these challenges and we continue to overcome these challenges one day at a time. So with that, I wanna share with you this, this film that will give you kind of, a, kind of an affirmation of what you've been going through. This time has been so difficult for many people. Parents have not been able to see children. Grandparents have not been able to see grandchildren. People feel isolated, disconnected from society and friends, family. There's people who are very capable in their work who have suddenly lost that work for no fault of their own. There are young people who have not seen their friends except to interact with them online. And now we're hearing more and more people who are losing their homes. People who pay rent and just can't pay anymore and have to figure out what to do, where to live. Young people who found refuge going to college, starting a new life, maybe getting away from parents who, who don't see the world the same way as they do, suddenly are not just back at home, but stuck at home. They can't go to a cafe to work for a couple of hours or a library. They're in their house with a parent who may be abusive, unaccepting. This time of coronavirus has been a strain for lots of people, particularly older folks who, who live alone, uh, not able to get family and friends to visit like maybe they used to. Not able to get out and about like they used to. It's a time of great suffering and of course great empathy, great love, great outpouring of care for each other. But it doesn't take away from the fear, the pain, the sorrow that many people feel during this time of coronavirus. I share that with you in a way to acknowledge the elephant that's in the Zoom, as it were. Uh, you know, we've been going through a hard time and also we have learned to adapt. I mean, here we are on Zoom. For the you know we, we now do these things on zoom and we're able to do so and more people have shown up than ever before and we've also found ways to encourage other people and to help other people so the thing that i'm excited about is that there's going to be a day coming up not too much into the future that this pandemic is officially over in fact um, by this time next year maybe there'll be a lot of people vaccinated and life is going to start up again now, it's never going to be exactly the same, we'll never be the same, but we'll be able to go out safely, live our lives, connect with other people. And, and I don't know about you, but I've been like starting to plan like my post-pandemic life. And one of the first things I want to do is go to a very full packed movie theater, like this just jammed packed with people. Uh, and I want to see a comedy, really stupid comedy, or a really scary horror movie. One that like people really react and like we're all kind of jostling and reacting together. Uh, I, I don't know. I just want to be in this like tight, vibrant space after being stuck in my house. So what about you? I want you to think about this. Once this pandemic is truly over, and it is, and you can go out safely and freely, what's something you're looking forward to doing? Mindy's going to put that into the, the chat. I want you to take a moment to think about it. On your paper, you can write down your answer and then feel free to just pro start putting into the chat what you would like to do once the pandemic's over. What's one thing of the many things you want to do once the pandemic's over? 
you'll find that when I ask you a prompt to put into the chat, I'll almost always just be quiet and give us a chance to see what's happening and validate what people are saying. Thank you. Now I'm going to give you your next prompt. And you're going to see that this workshop is going to build with more prompts, longer time to reflect on it, and then breakout groups. And after this prompt, you're actually going to go into a breakout group. So Tamara's going to start getting that set up. Uh, and here's what I want you to think about in your next prompt. And that is, how have you personally adapted to the pandemic? And you're going to be writing about this on your piece of paper. You're going to have a full minute, and I'll tell you when that starts. And so how have you personally adapted during the pandemic? And how have you used your skills and talents to help others? Mindy's going to pop that into the chat. That's your prompt. You're going to have a full minute to just sit, write about that prompt. And we'll begin that now. And that's about a minute. We're going to be putting you into breakout rooms, and you're going to be in the same breakout room for three different times. So you'll get to know these folks. There'll be about five people in each breakout room uh, there, there about. Now, when you get to the breakout rooms, I got some very specific directions for you. I would love someone to volunteer as the group timekeeper, something at CCL we know about, right? When you go to a, a meeting with a member of Congress, you have a timekeeper. Well, you're going to be a timekeeper. Uh, and as a timekeeper, you are going to keep track of the time, which of course will kick you out of the room when it's over. But in, more importantly, you want to make sure that people have enough time. So for instance, this first breakout session is 10 minutes. So you're going to divide that between the number of people you have and just let people know, okay, we've got 10 minutes. Each person take about two minutes. And this way everyone gets a chance to respond. Once you figure out who the timekeeper is, you're going to basically Start with the timekeeper, say your name, where you're from, and what's your CCL connection. Are you a volunteer, a, a chapter leader, etc.? And then you'll share your answers to the prompt. How have you personally adapted during the pandemic? How have you used your skills and talents to help others? So, Mindy, if you could put into the chat those directions. Uh, someone please volunteer as the group team timekeeper. And, uh, and we're going to put you into your groups. But before anyone confused, have any questions about what you're going to do? Hey, Tamara? Peterson, um, yes. would you like the co-hosts to be in rooms or out of rooms? Um, I think it's up to the co-host. Uh, I need to stay out and do some stuff, but thanks for asking. OK, great. Anybody who's about to go into a breakout group have any questions about what you're fixing to do? OK. Off you go. I'll see you in 10 minutes. All right, and they're back. They're now. back on Zoom. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that your breakouts went well uh, and, uh, and we're ready to just kind of carry on. Look at everybody's faces here. How fun is that? Loving yeah. that. <laughs> so um, what we want to talk about in the second part of this workshop, this is in three parts. This is part two now. I want to talk about passions because passions Passions are really important. And to know your passions, to validate those passions, that's really important. And so this workshop really is about pursuing our passions. If you can't figure out your purpose, figure out your passion. For your passion will lead you right into your purpose. And I'm sure if I ask people, like, have you experienced this? A lot of people will say, yeah. Uh, in, in many ways, I'm sure Lots of people are here with CCL because it was your passion that led you to this place. And it also led you to try new things that you maybe wouldn't have thought to do before. I want to, a very important thing, I think, is to create a list of our passions, like a long list. And not too long ago, I created a list of 50 of my, my top 50 passions. And when I say passions, I, I mean like everything. And some of them may be considered really silly to the point where you're a little embarrassed to tell people about it. Uh, like, so for instance, one of my passions is Pokemon Go. I don't know if you've ever seen this like game on your phone and you walk around and you collect these little Pokemon. It is for children, I understand, but I love it. I can't explain why I love it so much. I hate most other video games and stuff. I love that game. So I'm gonna give you just an abridged list of some of my passions. Some may be considered silly and frivolous, others serious. To me, they're all quite serious, including the very first one. 
coffee. Coffee is a passion of mine. It's also a biological need. <laughs> and it's really good that I have it first thing in the morning. But I love coffee. I spend a lot of time reading about coffee, watching videos, how to make the perfect coffee, spending money on coffee. It is clearly a passion. Another passion of mine, typewriters, manual typewriters. In fact, you're gonna see right behind me, that was the first one I ever got. It was my mom's Royal Quiet Deluxe Manual Typewriter. I inherited it when she passed away. And I love, I use it every day. I um, type up a to-do list. And, and you know, the funny thing is with something with typewriters, you let people know you have a typewriter and suddenly you get more. And I, at one point I had a collection of six typewriters because people just kept giving me typewriters and then I give them away to other people. Uh, but I just love them. I don't know why, it's one of my passions. I adore them. Another one of my passions is hospitality. My parents, uh, Italian-American, they owned a restaurant for many years. So feeding people, hosting people, that's a big thing in our lives. And really, there's nothing I like more than making a big meal for people and, and, and sharing some hospitality. Another big passion of mine is storytelling. It might be on stage, it could be through radio. Those of you who've listened to Citizens Climate Radio know that storytelling comes back over and over again because it's an incredibly powerful tool. One other passion in my life, and I maybe don't talk about it so much, but it's, um, it doesn't come up in Citizens Climate Radio at least, but another passion is uh, youth homelessness, especially for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth. And I'll tell you a little bit about that passion in a moment, but first I want us to explore our own passion. And to do that, I'm gonna give you a chance to spend a little time coming up with your own list. Now it's true, we're all very passionate about climate advocacy, why else would we be here, right? But there's a lot more to you. There's a lot more that makes you who you are. So in a moment, I'm gonna give you five minutes, five solid minutes of quiet to write a list of your own passions, write a full list, don't hold back. You have five minutes, write as many things as possible. During this reflection time, I will not speak, but if you get stuck, turn to the chat. Just say, I'm stuck, and I'll also be putting prompts to help you. So to help you just right now, before we begin our five minutes, to think about what is a passion. Think about what captures your time and attention. That's often an indication that it's a passion. What do you spend your money on? That is very much an indication of what your passion is, and especially if it's not something you have to spend your money on. What would you miss if it were suddenly gone? That can reveal your passion. It might be a person, a place, a thing, an activity, a food. And what's an issue that moves you to action? Yes, climate change, but are there other issues that move you to action? You're gonna have five minutes uh, and, your, and your prompt basically is to write a list of as many passions as you can. And you have five minutes starting now. Okay, we're about at that five minute point. So I hope people were able to come up with at least two things, but uh, I wanna look at the gallery. Anybody come up with um, at least 10 passions? Uh, Raise your hand. Oh, good. Um, 15 or more? Those are some very passionate people. 20 or more? Nice. Okay. More than 25? Well done. Okay. What I want you to do is just choose um, one or two of your passions and just pop them into the chat so that we can just see the kind of passions that are represented. Feel free to let it be a silly one or a serious one or however. I think they're all quite serious because it's your passion. But put into a chat one or two of your passions. You know, I think people, we, we are made up of so many things, including our passions. And sometimes a passion chooses us. We don't choose it. I'm sure people have stories about that. I want to tell you a little bit more about my one passion for uh, homeless youth, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender homeless youth. Let me go back to the present mode. Don't want that slide, hold on. Should have been a little bit more prepared with that one. <laughs> so you just created your full list of your own passions and we've shared those. 
And, and again, that's part of the makeup of who you are, what motivates you, what you do in the world, what, what gets you engaged. Now, for me, um, there's a particular passion I have, and that's for LGBTQ youth. And to help you kind of understand this passion a little bit more, I want to share with you uh, a short film that the UN put out. It's, um, it's a short film uh, about uh, homeless youth. And you know it, it is very much based in a story. So I'm going to put this YouTube video on and it will give you kind of a sense of what some of the plight is for, for LGBTQ youth uh, and, and in a way why there's so much homelessness and the challenge of being lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer and homeless at the same time. My name is Kellen, I'm 19. I like reading, I like going to like art museums in the city and painting or drawing. I had moved out of my parents' house because I was seeing a doctor who confided in him and then he told my parents on their permission and things were just really tense and there was a lot of yelling. It was just, it felt like the right time to, to leave. It was hard being out of my parents' house because I've lived with them my entire life and that was the first time that, was, that I was like on my own. It was also like difficult hopping around and sleeping on people's couches, not having a stable place to be in. So I came here through the suggestion of a friend. The Ali Fernay Center is the largest organization in the United States and in the world dedicated to homeless LGBT youth. We primarily focus on providing housing to, to young people who have been kicked out of their homes because of, of homophobia and transphobia, uh, but we have a really broad array of services to really help young people be healed. I mean, to help them be safe, to help them get off the streets, but also to help heal them from the harms of, of homelessness and rejection. The genesis of the Ali Fernay Center is the, the death of Ali Fernay, which happened 20 years ago. Ali was a, a gender non-conforming homeless youth who, at the age of 22, was murdered back in 1997. At that time, there was no kind of safe shelter in New York City for homeless LGBT youth. I don't think at that time there was any kind of safe shelter for LGBT youth in the entire country. We're living in a time where more and more people feel free and able to express themselves as being LGBT. Unfortunately, as much as the acceptance is growing, there are still many people in every society who tend to be very hostile to LGBT people. When your parents are, are like that, it is very unsafe to come out of the closet. When you're a teenager, when you're still reliant on your parents for economic support, so what we see happening all over the United States and all over the world is that more and more young people are coming out of the closet and unfortunately huge numbers of them are being rejected by their families and forced into homelessness. The Alley Forney Center has helped me a lot with housing and employment and I'm definitely a lot happier now than I was a year ago. I'm in a much better place. Hopefully in the future I'll have either be, be in college or graduated already. My number one career goal is to be a curator at a museum in the city, so you have to go to college for that. My relationship with my family now, it gets like worse and better. My mom right now is pretty good, like we text every day. I'm not talking to my dad currently because things are kind of difficult with him. I don't feel like comfortable going back to their home at this point. I want them to know that I'm okay, like as okay as I can be, and that I'm doing, I'm doing well and this is not like a phase and I'm happiest in this form than I was before.
I know this is heavy, um, but I think it's important to recognize that those of us who do, do climate work, we're always dealing with heavy stuff, right? This is, we're not in it because we like want fun, light stuff. We, we take on the hard stuff. And for me, homeless youth is definitely one of those hard, hard issues. And, uh, you know, what I, what I think about that's shocking is these are young people who have decided that it's safer to live on the streets of a city that they don't even know than to stay in their own communities and in their own homes. And what is really challenging for them though is they're often very reticent to go to shelters. And in part that's because they experience the same sort of discrimination and bullying at the shelters than they, they do at other places. And that's why having special shelters just for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, non-binary youth has been very important. Um, and also some of these places, they're run by churches that may be very welcoming, but the kid doesn't know that because they maybe only had negative experiences with religious institutions. And so I, as somebody who cares about climate change and cares about the homeless youth, it gets me wondering, like, how do I connect these things? Are they connected? So for instance, what happens when the storms come? we are going to see more storms, bigger storms. We're already seeing that. Where do these kids go? I mean, if they're afraid of going to shelters, where do they go? The thing about climate change, and we've heard Dr. Natasha DeJarnette talk about this loads of time, it's a threat multiplier. It makes existing threats bigger. And that's not just about weather, but about social situations. So if you have a mobility issue, if you have a problem with police, if you have a problem with your gender identity, it's going to get bigger when there are these extreme weather events because it puts pressure on the system. And uh, the, the discrimination can become magnified too because you have to deal with all sorts of new realities. So this made me get curious though, because I, I mean, I'm like you, I'm looking for solutions, right? So what if I connect my passions? Uh, so for instance, you know, I've got this passion for, for uh, homelessness and youth. I spent time actually thinking, how is homelessness uh, a climate issue? And we know this because lots of people get displaced during extreme weather events, fires, floods, but already there may be kids living on the streets during those situations. How can, how can I use storytelling online, in person, perhaps in a Zoom presentation, <laughs> to raise awareness with, for other, with other people who don't know about this? Uh, that's a question I'm thinking of because I love storytelling and could I do that? And oh my gosh, I just did it here in this, in this very Zoom. And what about hospitality? Is there a way that I could take my passion for hospitality and extend it somehow to, to help address the problem of homelessness for youth and for adults. So with that, we're going to go to our next prompt. And this is going to be a longer time you have for the prompt. And you're going to be able to make these connections. And I want to give you two more examples to help you with these connections. All right, because we're looking at, in many ways, climate change in regards to extreme weather events and the impacts of climate change. We're already working on climate change when it comes to passing a bill to, to mitigate climate change. But once that's done, there's still gonna be these, these impacts. So let me give you another example. Say one of your passions is camping, right? How many of you camping is, is one of your passions? It is definitely one of mine, although I go you know, in a very fancy tent, but I, liked, I like it all the same. Now that's definitely threatened. It's hard to go camping at times during extreme weather events. I have a friend who wanted to do a three week camping trip. She had to cut it short, Colorado, because of wildfires and they shut down all the camping sites and she had to flee. So camping is at risk, but also since you, you love camping, you actually have something to offer in a time of climate change. Because if you know how to camp, you have equipment and you know how to live without electricity and running water for days and weeks. Not only could you use those skills to help your own family, you can train people on your block and in your neighborhood so that they're more prepared for an extreme weather event when the lights go out and they have to basically camp in their homes. Here's another example, baking. How many of you are bakers and you like to, to bake? A couple of bakers there. Uh, wheat 
you know, which, you know, unless you're gluten free, a lot of times you use wheat for baking that could be threatened by climate change because of extreme heat waves, crop failures, but also baking can be a way for us to respond to climate change in that if there is an extreme weather event and you're cut off from going to the supermarket, if you've got the supplies, you can bake your own bread. You can even make bread for your neighbors. So these passions you have, there are definitely many of them affected by climate change, but they're, so they're what you're fighting for. You're fighting, you know, to protect these things, but there also are tools to help us adapt, to be resilient and to look after each other. So here's your next prompt. Looking at the list of your passions, choose one or two, maybe three, and ask yourself, how can I use one or more of these passions to help my community address climate change or protect a person, place, or thing that I love? How can my passion, how can I use my passion to adapt to extreme weather and other climate impacts? So you're going to have five minutes. Mindy's going to put that into the chat and try to avoid like big passions like world peace and mitigating climate change, but things that, you know, kind of are the more the everyday passions may be with an issue as well. And so like with the camping or the baking or the storytelling or the hospitality, how can you use these to help your community? Any, any questions that anybody has about this prompt before I give you your five minutes? Feel free to unmute and ask if you do. All right, you have five minutes. All right, that's our five minutes. And this is hard work. It's kind of thinking outside the box in a different way. And I think at CCL, we're so used to coming up with proposing policy ideas to address uh, climate, the causes of climate change. We don't spend as much time clearly talking about climate adaptation and resiliency. But the reality is we're gonna be successful. We're gonna see this legislation pass. And in a way, our work will be done at CCL but the work is not done, right? There's like, what else, what else is there? Uh, and one of the things that will be a hallmark of all of our lives is individually and as communities dealing with the impacts of climate change. And those impacts are emotional, physical, uh, multiple needs, and you know, there's work to be done. And you may have a very special role in your own community and in addressing that. So with that, I'm going to give you a chance to get back together with your breakout groups. You're going to have 12 minutes. And in the breakout group, it's for you to have a discussion about your passions. And maybe you're stuck. Maybe you're like, I don't even know how to begin to do this. Uh, if that's so, listen to a couple other people, see how they've made their connections, uh, and, and share what you have, what you think you have. This is all sort of brainstorming. But it's about trying to get these different pieces of your life and seeing how can they come together to support each other or to address this, the impacts of climate change that we're seeing. You'll have 12 minutes, same people in the group, timekeeper, same timekeeper, make sure that people know how much time that they have each. Uh, and uh, any questions before you go into your breakout rooms? All right, and off you go. Well, I want to I want to show you a short film. This is the third film. Now, the first two films were kind of sad. I get it. This next film's a much more uplifting. It's from an episode of Citizens Climate Radio in which we talked about imagination and envisioning the future. In fact, there's a great thought exercise in it where people have to imagine what the world's going to be like once there are no fossil fuels being doesn't talk about how we're going to get there, but just like, what will it smell like? What will it sound like? And it's a really great exercise. Dr. Dijarnet, who is um, going to be the new uh, board chair, uh, is also was on that episode. So it's just a one minute trailer for the, for the podcast, but I, it will give you a nice sense of, um, of just sort of opening up imagination because that's what you're going to need for this next activity. Are you all ready? It's our responsibility as climate communicators to be spreading climate hope, because otherwise we're in trouble. Just imagine this whole new world. What does the world sound like? What does your streets sound like? What does the world 
smell like? It sounds like Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. That's what I hear. But more tangibly, I hear the sounds of children playing outside, laughing, free from environmental induced asthma, running around with not a care in the world, healthy. What does it smell like? It smells like fresh air. It smells like no toxic industrial fumes in our neighborhood. To me, that smells like possibility. I love that. For me, it smells like possibility. I just love that. And I, and for us, for the work that we do, it's hard work. And it's very important for us to establish what are we fighting for? We know what we're fighting against. We yeah, totally but what does, what does possibility smell like? What does possibility smell like? Well, the possibility of like being in a city and not smelling fumes, but smelling flowers. I mean, that's part of like this imagining process of, you know, kind of letting us kind of identify what it is that we're fighting for. When we're communicating climate change, it's so easy to talk about the terrible things that climate change will bring. But being able to articulate how the world's going to be a better place once we're off fossil fuels, that can get people really excited. And that means there'll be possibilities of also kids not being sick with asthma. That's an awesome, awesome thing. And I showed that. Um, yeah, I can definitely share the, the link. In fact, that's from, um, that's from episode 50, uh, 49 of uh, Citizens Climate Radio. And um, I will get a link for you in a we'll moment. We'll get it. We'll get it, Peterson. Great. And, uh, and, and, and you can listen to the whole episode and it's very, very powerful. But I, I do that because the next step of this three-part thing is we're going to take a little trip. We're going to travel to the future. It's a little known Zoom feature, kind of a backdoor feature that I can put you into a breakout room actually 10 years into the future. It's kind of amazing. I know I don't really share it with a lot of people just because they don't know how to figure it out. I tried, but we're going to travel to the year 2030. It'll be December 6, 2030. And when you go into those breakout rooms, it's no longer 2020. It's going to be 2030. And I'll give you in a moment to give you a prompt of what, what to say. But here are some things that we have to agree on in this future that we're going to. For one, carbon fee and dividend has already become the law of the land. And it was fully implemented by the spring of 2023. How it got there, we're not going to have a conversation about that. But it's there. It's just a reality. It's been already there. It sparked a global a global innovation and, and be, what became known as the great transition started as a result. So we're already into that. It's 2030. Now, the impacts of climate change have also intensified, resulting in bigger storms, droughts, sea level rise, displacement, migration, humanitarian crisis in different parts of North America and around the world. So we were successful. And there's more work to do. So in a moment, I'm going to give you a chance to write about what your future, what's happening in the future. And I want to give you an example of what I'm going to have you do. The first thing on your piece of paper you can do right now, um, write December 6, 2030, and next to it, how old you are on that day. I know, it's a little scary to add 10, 10 years to your life. But there it is. I promise you're going to look wonderful 10 years from now. You won't change a bit. And then I'm going to have you work on a prompt. And I'm going to show you first how it works. And the prompt's going to be very simple. It's going to be something like back in 2020, and then you'll write a little bit about who you were and what you did in 2020. But now in 2030, well, then you're going to fill us in on what your day-to-day -day life looks like. Give us an update about your passion and your relationship to it. Don't worry, that's going to go on the prompt in a moment. Before we do, I want to give you an example of my own. So for me, Peterson Toscano, here in the year 2030, I am now 65 years old. I know, I look damn good, right? 65, I'm looking great. And I feel great too. Now you have to remember back in 2020, I was still hosting Citizens Climate Radio, but today I actually live on a farm in South Africa. My husband, Glenn, is originally from South Africa. Uh, now, when we arrived a couple of years ago, we first ran a B&B &B and a bookstore, sort of a kind of a retirement spot to have. 
But we kept hearing stories about people, particularly lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans people in South Africa and outside of South Africa who needed safe places to live. So now in addition to running this B&B, we also offer some spaces for short-term and long-term housing for people who are kind of refugees or trying to find a safe place. And some of the guests have also contributed to a video series I've been producing about the lives of LGBTQ people on the African continent. Now, I just want you to know, when I shared the scenario with Glenn earlier today, he said, that's incredibly ambitious. I, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna have enough energy at that point to be doing something on that scale. And I was like, okay, all right, well, what, what could you see us doing in 10 years? And he said, all right, 2030, uh, we're still in our little town of Sunbury in Pennsylvania. And once a month, we host a very special dinner. He said, you cook one of your best dishes and we invite a hand-selected group of people for an evening of discussion of topics that interest us. It could be climate change, LGBTQ issues. And at the end of the meal, you ask people to donate some money, what they would have paid for a meal like this uh, to go to a, a LGBTQ youth homeless shelter or some other charity you wanna raise money for. It's like, oh, okay, I could see that too. So when you do this, if you want dream big, do the South African farm version of this, or something that like kind of just can fold into your life, kind of an extension of what you already do. And, and all I'm asking you to do is just kind of take the trip. You're gonna have, um, you're gonna have some time, five minutes to write and think about the prompt. Mindy, you can put the prompt in the chat now. And you're gonna put on the paper, your age, you already did that, and then just write it. What you do in 2020 and now in 2030, what you're doing. You'll have five solid minutes to write, reflect, dream, let it happen. Try not to create like alien invasions or new technologies that don't exist. Kind of stick to your own life or what you have some control over. And uh, in five minutes, you're going to go into breakout rooms, but I'll, I'll talk to you before we go to breakout rooms. You have five minutes. All right. And we have come to that time. I hope your creativity is beginning to emerge. There's something very powerful about these sorts of thought exercises. Our brains are highly creative and we can, we can help manipulate the brain in a certain way by doing these things. So for instance, speaking as if you're in the future, as if carbon fee and dividend has already passed and looking at the present as if it were the past, looking back at our present, that's a very powerful thing. It unlocks certain things in our brains. And for creative people like me, these kind of thought experiments and exercises really help to, to broaden the thinking. And it can really help actually with problem solving. What we're doing is technically called a, a, a future protocol. And it's about using future thinking to solve current day problems. Now, you're gonna have 15 minutes in a breakout group, same breakout group, but I want you to work really hard at disciplining yourself. When you get to this breakout room, it is the year 2030. So speak about 2020 as the past. 10 years have passed. Now it's, it's gonna feel a little corny at first, I, I admit, but stay in the future looking back. This will definitely unlock your creativity. In your breakout groups, basically you're going to share what, what your future is, your response to this prompt, what you've written, give people a sense. You don't have to tell them your age if you don't want to, it's 10 years have passed. But tell them like, okay, in 2020, this is what I was doing. Today, this is what my life looks like. It may not be the big South Africa B&B experience, but just a slice. Because one of the most important things for us doing climate work is to imagine a future that is livable and see ourselves in it with the details. So with that, you're gonna go into your breakout group and meet up in 10 years. So have a good trip to the future. Okay, everyone. I have designed this workshop so that we have time at the end. That's why I specifically said, let's have two hours so we don't have to rush through all of this. We have 15 minutes, 15 minutes to share out. Uh, and this, we could have as many people as possible do that if you uh, can keep your comments short so if, um, if you have something you'd like to share about a takeaway, something you learned about yourself, something that you're excited about for the future, or if you have a question, 
use the raise hand feature. Now, if you have one of the newer versions of Zoom, to get to that, you click on participants at the bottom. And there should be an option on the bottom right-ish under all the list of names where it says raise hand. Do you, do you see that? When you do that, that will digitally raise your hand. And then um, Tamara, would you be willing to call on people and then give you a chance to you know, sure. unmute and, and do that? Yeah, so all right. if you want to, I see the hands are going up. Any takeaways you have, what you're excited about in the future or any questions? Yeah, let's start with Nancy. Go ahead and unmute. Well, I found the workshop was very uplifting and it made me think we can do some of these things in our CCL meetings and they could be a lot of fun because mm -hmm. sometimes organizing gets really tedious and <clears throat> this just felt like um, really refreshing. So thank you, Peterson. And I guess the big thing, my takeaway is also um, begin with the end in mind. And we're beginning to help with a community project to start an organic demonstration farm. And I'm just thinking, maybe I can challenge people, you know, let's, let's go to 2030. What do we want to be have here in 2030, you know, and maybe use this exercise. So, and as I get ready to retire next month too. <laughs> Good, thank you. There's a song by David Wilcox called Start With The Ending. Has anybody heard of it? It's mm -hmm. really great. It's, a, it's yeah, it's about relationships, but it's a, you know, same concept, start with the ending. So I highly recommend it. So how about Joyce? You want to unmute yourself? Yes, I, um, I really have, I was just trained by Al Gore way back in 2007. And, and, and so for me, this focus on um, a better future, what is it we're going toward? Give people, but if you're gonna ask folks to change, then the opportunity to see what it is that's really good, that's better than that. And, and, and that envisioning that, sharing that was really helpful for me. And um, taking time for imagination. Also, I recognized that um, that my creative thinking led me to say, uh, reach out to other groups that are natural allies or maybe not so natural allies, including, including LGBTQ and uh, people of color. Thank you, Joyce. David, go ahead. Go, go ahead and unmute yourself. David Oyen. Okay, thank you. Yep, yep. Um, thank you. I uh, I concur. This is a great. Um, it was great to meet everybody and uh, and hear all the perspectives. And I think kind of one of my main takeaways is that uh, just a reminder that you know uh, there's not a silver bullet. Uh, there are uh, there are ten thousand things uh, that are going to um, you know help us reach uh, the objective that uh, uh, that we're all committed to. And, uh, you know, whether that's policy or, or policy or gardening or, you know, uh, communication through social media, other ways, uh, you know, uh, child education, uh, th there are just so many things. And it was, uh, you know, very heartening for me to hear all the different perspectives, uh, you know, especially in the, in the breakout groups, uh, all the ideas that people had. Um, one request I would have, uh, Peterson, if, if you could collect and send and share all the emails uh, with everybody that participated in this event. There are certainly people that I want to stay in contact with uh, and, uh, you know, I'm willing to offer uh, whatever I can of value to, I mean, to anybody else as well. Uh, organic farming, you know, has come up a time or two in the conversations and uh, that's my life. That's one of my passions. So I'm happy to connect with any people you know, in that realm that uh, um, I might be able to make some contribution. Yeah, I'm not sure what the protocol, I'll check what the protocol is about sharing emails. I mean, a lot of us are, Tamara? Yeah, I was just going to say, I love your passion, David. We won't be able to share emails publicly. It just goes against our policy. But if you do want to make sure that anybody gets your email, just go ahead and drop it into the chat right now. That's what we've done in, in workshops past. Um, okay, yeah, and I already did add mine uh, to the chat uh, earlier. Uh, thanks. So. Okay, David, timeless food. Thanks, David. Sorry to yep. shut you down, but uh, nope, you know, we nope, have to fine. protect privacy around here. All right, thank you, David. Okay. Um, Julia Smith from Texas, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself? Hi, I 
You know, I think one of Peterson's great gifts is uh, creativity. And I think that's what's going to get us out of this mess is, is allowing our creative brains to really flourish. Uh, you know, just doing the same old thing, same old thing is not going to help us. So I think it's really great to have a session where we have creativity and we have some playfulness. Um, we let that part of our brain out because a lot of times we get to being adults and we kind of put it away. So I really appreciate that, Peterson. I think we need to all um, be open to creative new insights as we go forward towards 2030 in the future that'll help with climate and with so many other human problems. So thank you so much. Thanks, thanks, Julia. I just heard um, um, McKibben speak about uh, about imagination, and he said this many, many times. Bill McKibben about how uh, what we need so much in the climate movement. If there's been a failure of imagination, and that's really um, you know one of the things that's needed, and that's why in Citizen Climate Radio, one of the features I have is the art house where I bring in artists uh, who are doing work on climate change, and they have this different way of looking at the world and engaging people uh, and, and people learn a lot of lessons from listening to these artists and the creative process and it's yet another tool again there's no silver bullet all these things right research and uh, lobbying all these things but we put these tools together and suddenly we've got a very powerful movement and creativity for me at least is one of the, the central ones thank you Julia I was going to chime in on that too and make a mention real quick while we're on the topic is and uh Josie, you mentioned this in the chat about feeding our bright brains. And I think that a lot of us as climate advocates and leaders just gets, can, we can get so focused on the action and the forward direction and that momentum that we forget that slowing down, sort of like this workshop, the way that you modeled this, Peterson, it's like a great role model for me as somebody who leads Zoom workshops as well. It's just like this space, the slowing down that actually integrates both our left brain, right brain, and our top brain, bottom brain, so that we are more effective in the climate advocacy that we do undertake. So, uh, Teresa, go ahead and unmute. Yeah, I actually had a um, request of Peterson. Um, I um, took your workshop during the June conference, the short one that was telling your climate story and imagining the future. And I mentioned that in my breakout group and some people were really interested in seeing that. And I'm wondering if you can tell us where we could find that, I assume on community somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's definitely was recorded. So it's in the, the CCL YouTube channel. There's a CCL YouTube channel and most of these sessions get recorded uh, and they are put into, uh, and we'll, we'll, I'll, in a moment, I'll find it for you and put the link there, but it's, it's there on YouTube and I'll, I'll get the link for you. Thank you. You can also search for, um, past conferences and have access to um, all of the session recordings. So that might be another way in to looking for that. Um, okay, uh, Mark Tabert, go ahead. I just uh, wanna say I enjoyed the 10, the 10 year exercise. When you first talked about it, I thought, oh my God, 10 years were dead, you know? But going through the process, um, I came up with a very optimistic future and I enjoyed doing that. And I also enjoyed the passion exercise. That was, my list grew, my, my list grew, it was fun to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Sarah, go ahead, Sarah B. I am struck most, I think, by how vitally important hope is. Sarah, we're having a hard time hearing you. You're breaking up a lot. I'm not oh, sure if you, if you can How look. vitally important hope is. How vitally Other important hope that. is. Yeah, you might need to chat the rest of your message because you're breaking up quite a bit. If you can go ahead and close some programs on your computer, that might help. Um, or you can go ahead and share that in the chat, but we're not hearing you very well, I'm afraid. I'm sorry. Okay, how vitally important hope is. That is your message. Powerful, short, and sweet. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, Linda Paget, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I uh, really, really appreciated the connection with uh, the, the passions and then the opportunity to, to 
synergize them, put them together. And I just feel energized and grateful. And I, so I'm so, I'm excited. And I wanna keep, it seems easy to let the passion slide in the course of day, especially during the pandemic for me, there's so much to do on a daily basis that I think just for me carving out a sacred time each day to really be able to focus on that um, will be, I, I feel that's a possibility. Thank you. You're welcome. And Linda, your experience is very similar to the, the business students that I do this for. And I think what they like about it, they expect that a presentation about climate change, the message is going to be drop everything that's important to you. This is the big one. Mm -hmm. And instead this is saying, no, no, hold those things closer because that's what you may need to address this. That's what you're fighting for. That's what you're working with. And they they feel very affirmed. And that's what's nice about this kind of a workshop. And if at your regional gathering or someplace you want me to do it for, for one of your groups, you let me know. Great. And go ahead, Monica. How about you, Monica? Don't forget to unmute. There you go. Thank you. I made some great connections during these two hours. And one that I'd like to share right now are things that Mark said in our breakout room. In 2030, when we've solved the climate problem, we can focus on solving some other problems like plastics and the problem with corporations. And I realized the huge ache that I have generational problems. I feel like we're really not doing right to the younger generation and they're angry. But maybe when we have solved this climate problem with some good policies, we can get re reconnected with the young people. And that was just like, wow, such a beautiful thing to think about. So thank you. I, I love that. And as you say that, it reminds me when I was in DC one June is when the Supreme Court did something about that legalized marriage for LGBTQ people. And I remember just how relieved I was as a gay person, like, you know what, because I'm tired of fighting that. I have other things I really want to work on. And I'm just so glad that that's out of the way, that I don't have to fight for my basic rights for that, because I really care about a lot of other stuff. And, and that, I think, is one of the exciting things. We're going to win. This is going to happen. Carbon fee and dividend is going to pass. And then, you know, this work that we've done, we will be able to celebrate, and it will then free you in an extraordinary way to figure out what's your next move. And it could be really big. Um, it could be just something totally integrated into your life and expanding the passion that you have. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for showing up, for stepping up and doing the work. You know, this reflection work is hard. I ask you to think outside the box. I want to give a very, very special thanks to Mindy for all of her help with the chat, for Todd, for, for looking over everything and being this friendly presence and, and Tamara for helping us out with the breakout groups and facilitating. You all are wonderful. Uh, if you want any of the links, I put my email in there in the chat. Uh, feel free to email me and I'll send you links and notes or whatever else you need. Uh, and if you haven't done so yet, listen to Citizens Climate Radio because we do this stuff all the time on there. It's a monthly show. You can get it wherever you get podcasts. And we are at the end of our session. Thank you, everybody. Feel free to unmute and say goodbye. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Citizens Climate Lobby's training program. You can tune into more episodes anywhere podcasts are available. Inspired by what you heard today? Join Citizens Climate Lobby to advocate for bipartisan climate solutions. Go to community.citizensclimate.org to find more trainings, resources, your local chapter, national action teams, discussion forums, and more. Be sure to like our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Citizens Climate. We also invite all of our listeners to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more inspiration. And together, we are creating the political will for a livable world.